All right, so today I'm going to be t uh, talking about the Dirichlet divisor problem. So if we say that d of n, this is the number of ways uh, to be able to write uh, n as the product of two numbers, the Dirichlet divisor problem, this is the following statement. It says that if we say that d of x is equal to the sum of all integers less than or equal to x of the divisor function of n. This is equal to x log x plus x times 2 gamma minus 1, where gamma is the euler mascheroni constant, plus big O of x to the theta plus epsilon for any small epsilon. The goal of this uh, problem, so the Dirichlet divisor problem, is to find the smallest possible value of theta where this is going to be true um, no matter what. And so we're going to go through the different things that we know about this in order to be able to solve this. Now, the divisor function, d of n, can also be written as the sum of all j's and k's in the natural numbers such that j, k, is equal to n, and we're just adding up a whole bunch of ones. So that's how we are going to define uh, the divisor uh, function formally. So when uh, Dirichlet proposed this sort of question, like what's the value, smallest value of theta that he could, he was able to prove that this value, which he called delta x, he was able to show that delta x is at least big O of the square root of x. And this is something that um, is not too bad to show. Um, and in fact, it's not too hard to be able to get to the point where we can say that d of x, so this is equal to the sum of d of n, n less than or equal to x. It's not too bad to be able to say that this is the same thing as x log x uh, plus 2 gamma minus 1 x plus big of the square root of x. So that is what Dirichlet was able to show. Now, trying to improve this bound gets pretty tricky. So Dirichlet showed this back in 1850 or so, um, and the, the next question is, can we improve that at all? So in 1915, we were able, or we collectively, so a mathematician named G.H. Hardy, he was able to find a lower bound for theta. So he was able to show that theta has to be strictly bigger than or equal to one fourth. And the way he did this is actually really, really clever. And I would like to go through this process together. So he begins by defining a function that is similar to big O. So remember, um, a function f of x is big O of g of x. This means that f of x, the absolute value of that, is always less than or equal to some constant times the absolute value of g of x. What he defined is he defined this new function uh, big omega of g of x. This is going to be the opposite. It's going to say that f of x is big omega of g of x if it's greater than or equal to some constant times the absolute value of g of x. So he is going to be using this in order to be able to go through and show that theta has to be bigger than or equal to one fourth. So the way that he starts this is he first states a theorem um, that a man named Erhard Schmidt uh, came up with in 1903. Specifically, that pi of x minus li of x plus one half li of the square root of x that this is big omega of the square root of x over log x. So he starts with this. Remember pi of x, this is the number of primes less than or equal to x. He was able, so Schmidt was able to prove this. And um, what, uh, what Hardy does is he uses an equivalent statement of this in order to solve his particular problem. So this entire statement was able to be shown is the same thing 
as psi of x minus x is big omega of the square root of x, where psi of x is the sum over all prime powers less than or equal to x of log p. So he was able to show that this statement that Schmidt uh, used is equivalent to this, and then he took this and was able to uh, go through the process of showing that our function um, delta x is going to be big omega of uh, x to the one fourth. So the way that he did this is he started with this assumption right here, and he also assumed the Riemann hypothesis. The, sorry, the Riemann hypothesis. Now, this might sound problematic because the Riemann hypothesis is something that we don't actually know yet. However, it turns out that assuming the Riemann hypothesis is actually stricter than assuming the Riemann hypothesis is false. So, assuming the Riemann hypothesis actually only hurts us, and so he, by assuming that, he was able to still go through the process and be able to get to the end result. So, I'm not going to go through all of his process because it was a 25 page paper, but I'm going to jump to the next big idea that he did. And specifically, this big idea took him five pages to do, but he was able to get to this function. So the function fancy f of s equaling the sum from n equal to one to infinity of d of n minus log n minus two gamma e to the negative s square root n. So he just defined this function and specifically he was able to show that this function is regular. Um, it's regular everywhere on the imaginary axis except at specific points. So except at the points s equals plus or minus 4 pi i square root of q, where q is a natural number. But that all of these places are singular poles. What we can then do, and this is how he went through his proof, he then defined the following function. He defined the function d sub n is equal to the sum from j equals one to n of d of j minus log of j minus two gamma. Notice that's the same thing that's showing up in here, just slightly different. And once he has this, he then defines another function, fancy g of s, to be the sum from n equals one to infinity of d sub n over the square root of n e to the negative s square root n. All right, let's pause for a moment and just ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Well, our goal is to get at this divisor function, so d sub j or d sub n. We're, our goal is to end up at something with those pieces involved. And what we're doing is we are setting up these functions. I don't know how hard he came up with them, but he has these functions and he is able to then take these functions and we are going to manipulate these functions to be able to get at the k value that we need in order to be able to show that this is going to be big omega of x to the one fourth. So what he then does is we have these functions and we are then going to let s be written as omega plus four pi i square root of q and we are going to say that omega is always bigger than zero and that it is heading towards zero. What we then have is there's an identity that he was able to prove that says that e to the negative s n, or e to the negative s square root n minus e to the negative s square root of n plus one is equal to s e to the negative s square root n over two square root n plus big O of e to the negative sigma square root n divided by n. Now this identity looks like it came out of nowhere, but it's going to make sense in one second. We're going to want to go back to our function of fancy f 
that we had right up there. And we can say that fancy f of s is equal to exactly what we have up there, d, whoops, sum n equals 1 to infinity of dn minus log n minus 2 gamma e to the minus s squared n. Now the question is, what is this going to be? Well, what we can do is we can rewrite dn minus log n minus 2 gamma. That is the same thing as the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of d sub n minus d sub n minus 1 e to the negative s squared n. If we take this and we replace them with what they are, ends, and we're just going to expand everything out, what we end up getting is we get, well, ignoring the d sub 0 because that doesn't exist, so we have a d sub 1 e to the negative s square root of 1 plus the sum from n equals 1 to infinity, whoops, n equals 2 to infinity. We then have d sub n minus d sub n minus 1 e to the negative s square root n, and if we distribute the dn's all the way through, this becomes, we have a d1 e to the negative s square root 1 plus the sum from n equals 2 to infinity of, we have a dn e to the negative s root n minus dn minus 1 e to the negative s square root of n. And if we do a change of index on these values here, these dn minus 1s and things, because this is an infinite sum, and uh, for different properties that this sum has, we can then change this to become a d sub n e to the negative s square root of n plus 1. And then we can combine everything back together, and it turns out that everything in the sum all collapses down to just being that f of s can be written as whoops, the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of dn times e to the negative s square root n minus e to the negative s square root of n plus 1. Well, this is precisely that function that we had just above us. So if we go through and plug that in, it turns out that we then are able to get that f sub s goes to s over 2 g of s plus big O of 1 over sigma. That's what we're able to get f of s down to be. From here, what we can do is, in his work, he's able to show, using some lemmas in the massive uh, set number of papers that he had, he's able to eventually get to the point that we get g of s is 2 over s, f of s, plus big O of 1 over sigma. This isn't too bad, this is just uh, rewriting the line that we have just above. But he was able to show that this is asymptotic to 1 plus i divide, times the divisor function of q divided by 4i square root of pi uh, q to the sigma to the 3 halves. And he was able to prove that. Now, if we do the same process that we just did, where we still have s is equal to sigma plus 4 pi i square root of q, um, but this time what we're doing is we are saying s is approaching 0 from the positive side. What we're able to get is we then get the, the expression f of s is equal to s over 2 g of s plus big O of 1 which then tells us that g of s is just big O of 1 over sigma. Now from these two different expressions that we got, what we're able to do is we are able to show the following four things. We can show that the sum from n less than or equal to x of dn, whoops, of dn over the square root of n times e to the negative 4 pi i square root of q plus sigma square root of n is asymptotic to 1 plus i dq divided by 
4 i square root of pi q to the 3 fourths sigma to the 3 halves. We have the sum from n less than or equal to x of d over n, d sub n square root n e to the negative sigma square root n is equal to little o of 1 over sigma to the 3 halves. And then we have almost the same things but with some slight modifications. And we get that the sum from n less than or equal to x of n to the negative 1 fourth e to the negative 4 pi i square root of q plus sigma square root of n. This is equal to little o of 1 over sigma to the 3 halves. And the sum from n less than or equal to x of n to the negative 1 fourth e to the negative sigma square root of n. This is asymptotic to the square root of pi divided by sigma to the 3 fourths. If we take these all expressions, all together what they do is they imply the following. They imply sum from n less than or equal to x of dn minus k times n to the 1 fourth over the square root of n e to the negative 4 pi i square root of q plus sigma square root n is asymptotic to 1 plus i dq divided by 4 i square root of pi q to the 3 fourths sigma to the 3 halves and that the sum of dn minus k n to the 1 fourth over the square root of n e to the negative sigma square root n this is asymptotic to negative k square root pi over sigma to the 3 halves, where k is the constant that we have in our uh, big omega. What we can do then is from these two things, we get a contradiction if k is smaller than this number, 2 pi square root 2 dq over q to the 3 fourths. We get a contradiction in this case, but since if it's bigger than k times something, it's definitely bigger than a smaller value of k for that. So we can always get a k value that's inside this range, so we will always get a contradiction. If this piece, the d sub n minus k n to the 1 fourth, if that is too big, meaning the k term wasn't big enough, um, or sorry, if it was too small, if that was less than or equal to zero, we get a contradiction. And this means that k has to exist. So we have successfully shown that dn, which was precisely the sum of our dn's, this is equal to, it is delta n plus big O log n. And it turns out that this implies that delta x is big O, not big O, is big omega of x to the one-fourth. So that is the best lower bound that we currently have. We actually are currently hypothesizing that this is actually the smallest value that is, and we think that this is the true value, but we haven't been able to prove that. The best we've been able to do is be using some upper bound things to be able to get um, better and better upper bounds. And our upper bounds have slowly been getting better. So they started one half, that was Dirichlet. So he was able to see this back in 1849. And then it improved in 1904 to a one-third by a mathematician named Voronoi, I think is how you say his name. And since then, it's not improved very much. Because this is about 0.3333 and so on. The best we've gotten today is 131 divided by 416 which is about 0 0.314903, and this was in 2003 by a man named M.N. Huxley. And so we've only improved it by about two one hundredths uh, from our upper bound from 120 years ago. So we don't have a ton of improvement, but we think it is going to be um, a one fourth, mainly due to some conjectures that we think are true in related problems and all of them would boil down to having 
delta of x not just be big omega of x to the one fourth, but also potentially just big O of x to the one fourth. I hope you enjoyed this uh, very quick overview of part of the Richley divisor function. I hope you all have a great rest of your day and good luck with all of your math.